west bank of the Nile River. Beautiful view. And this is a uh, security, this is a, uh, this is a tour security. Show them, your, show them your big gun. Got a big gun right there, so. Look, look at that though. Don't mess with that brother. Put a few hot ones in you. I right, my brothers and sisters, black power, black unity, black nationalism. Let's come together and rise once again. We are outside the temple. This is a little shopping area. You get a little bit of everything out here. But you better you better bring your negotiating skills to the table. Yeah. Because you're dealing with professionals here. Hello, Mr. You know, I got the snakes here. Show us the snake. We are leaving Kam Ambu on the west bank of the Nile River, going south to Aswan. And there you have uh, the temple, the Kam Ambu temple. Last big city in the south, city of the Aswan. capital of Nubia. Actually, the population of the city is 1.2 million. Further south, between here and the borders of Sudan, they have only villages and small towns. I wouldn't say towns, villages and communities. So this is really the last big city in the south. Actually, the name of this city came from the ancient name, Sun which means the market. It was a very important city, a very big city, one of the trading centers of the south between south and north, and it was on the route which was called the 40 days trading route because they used to have like caravans going between north and south, and this kind of trip took about 40 days. So it was like in the center of the place they called the soon or the market or the souk. So the high dam would be about 4 miles south of here. It takes us about 10 minutes maximum to get to the high dam. And this is the old dam that was built by the British in the late uh, 1800s. When you are on the high dam, you can use a regular camera, but not video camera. They do not allow video the resolution. The first person, his name was Mohammed Naki. Maybe not a big famous name but one of the generals of the army, an old man who ruled only for a few months, months. Then he was deposed by President Nasser and President Nasser took over. The big dream of President Nasser is to build the high dam. He seek the help of the European countries, the help of the United States, the help of the International Bank. Nobody wanted to help Egypt. As we were just coming out of the occupation, nobody trusted the Egyptian economy to pay back the loan that's needed for such a great uh, construction, a great project. So President Nasser decided to depend on Egyptian sources. The main source at that time, or let us say, the only source at that time for our income was the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was on Egyptian land, yes, at that time, but it was owned by the British and the French. 90% of the income went to England and France, 10% were left to Egypt as a courtesy. So that means nothing, peanuts for us. That's why President Nasser decided to nationalize the Suez Canal. 1956, he nationalized the Suez Canal, and he declared that to the whole world, his beat aroused the anger of England and France. And actually, that led to what is so-called the triple attack over Egypt, England, France, and Israel. Why Israel? Israel would like to find any chance to attack this country. So it found it a very good chance then to join England and France to attack Egypt. The, the, uh, the attack lasted for a few weeks and the main destruction actually was for three cities, we call them the three cities of the Suez Canal, Suez, Port Said and Ishmael. 
the three cities, big cities along the Suez Canal. And actually, this attack starts in a very strange way. We are stopped by the Russian leader, Nikita Khrushchev. He stood in the United Nations, he took his shoe off, and he started banging on the bank. Well, he said lots of things. Actually, he was so angry. One of the things he said, this world must be fair. You should stop this attack, or I'm going to use nuclear bombs over London. The attack stopped. The three carriages retreated. The Russians became very close friends to the Egyptians, and they started helping the Egyptians building the high dam, providing Egypt with lots of money, experts, engineers, architects. More than 3,000 experts brought from Russia to Egypt, lots of equipment, lots of money, and the high dam started to be built in 1961. The high dam took 10 years to be finished, so it was finished in 1971. But President Nasser, he died in 1970, by the end of 1970, so he couldn't really see the fruit of his work. So the man who inaugurated the high dam was President Sadat. He was the vice president of President Nasser, and that was 1971. The high dam is the biggest dam in the world, but it's not the highest. The biggest. The highest two dams are California Dam and Colorado Dam. These are the highest buildings. But the biggest is the high dam. But within a couple of years, it won't be the biggest anymore because the biggest dam is under construction nowadays in China. It's going to be a huge dam. The high dam, actually, a very big project. The distance between the two sides of the high dam about 1.6 miles. Actually, it is a great point because at the bottom, it is about three quarters of a mile thick. Tapering toward the top, hundreds and forty feet thick. It's bending toward the current to face the current. And they had to use granite from the area around the high dam. They used lots of explosions to get granite and stuff the body of the high dam. The body of the high dam is stuffed with 17 million tons of granite, which is enough to build eight pyramids, like the Great Pyramid of Giza. The dam actually is considered to be, for us, the project of the 20th century. It provides Egypt with 60% of the power. Actually, uh, after the construction of the high dam, of course, the turbines which generated electricity were, were brought from Russia. But when President Saddam, after some time, he decided, or he had some problems with the Russians, so he got those experts out of Egypt, and they started a new era with the United States. That's why the Russians stopped providing Egypt with spare parts for these generators. So these generators were replaced with another 12 built from GE, General Electric, and these are the turbines that's working nowadays. Right here, you see, that's not the Nile course, but it was used as the Nile course. They have to change the Nile course into this area while they were building the high dam. And when the high dam was constructed, they took it back to the original site. So nowadays, this part is used as a relief canal. When the Nile flooding is really high, so they use this part as a relief canal. When the high dam was constructed, the largest man-made lake in the world was formed out, and it's called Lake Nasser. I would say three quarters of it here in Egypt, one quarter is in Sudan. So the big part here in Egypt, we call it Lake Nasser, the part in Sudan, they call it the Nubian Sea. And in some books you read that it's the largest man-made lake, some other books you say no, it's the largest man-made lake is Lake Kariba on the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe. Anyway, both are here in this continent in Africa, either Lake Nasser or the, Kariba, the, uh, the Lake Kariba on, Kariba on the Zambezi River. Away from the water, 200,000 
Egyptians had to be relocated because their villages was about to be covered with water completely. So they moved them to the northern part of the high dam. They gave them land, palm trees, and built houses for them. In the beginning, they were so angry, so upset, but I guess nowadays they are used to the life they're having on the northern part of the high dam. So this is Lake Nasser on the right hand side, the largest man made lake in the world. And it, it has, uh, it's still 175 billion cubic meter of water. Yes, there is commercial fishing, of course, one of the main source of our freshwater fishing. You know, in the Nile itself, we don't have commercial fishing. We have individual fishing, some fishermen around, because it's not that wide. But Lake Nasser, actually, some parts of it are like 40 kilometers wide. That's like 25 miles wide. So, actually, it is like 300 miles long and 25 miles wide, the widest part uh, of the uh, Lake Nasser. Remember, when we stop, don't leave the bus with the video camera. Just the regular camera. Let's get a revolutionary cam once again. could have been prevented. I think it was a personal attack. That's how the wind will have no power to come into your area. Like Marcus Harvey said, the only protection against injustice is the man. Across over here is the other side of the dam, which is a uh, lake. Nasser, where over 5,000 years of Nubian history is covered. And they wouldn't let me take one of the camp on the dam itself, so this is what I can do. And we got a little, few little pictures and a few shots before. We used to have just agriculture in the uh, uh, of not having agriculture in the flooding season, which is the summer time. But nowadays we have water, we have agriculture all year round. And also, because of the high dam, nowadays we are creating a new Nile here in Egypt. This water, Lake Nasser, 175 billion cubic meters of water, the government had to think of a new project. So nowadays they are working on the project of the 21st century, which is creating a new Nile, a new river coming out of this lake through the western desert, cutting all the oasis. We call this great project Tushka. Tushka, because that's the point where they're going to get the water out of the lake into the new river. And it is believed that this new river, while they would think that they found some fossils and stuff that prove that used to be like thousands and thousands of years ago, the old Nile coast, because they found that the Nile silt is only five feet down under the ground in the desert. So it's going to be new area. This water, or this new Nile, or this project will be finished by the year 2007. It will be ready for 16 million people to live there and it will be used, the water will be used to claim 5 million acres of the western desert. So I guess it's going to be some kind of project for this country. The Nile is about, the deepest part in, uh, on that side is about 30 feet. 30, 30 feet deep, but the deepest part in the lake, 240 feet. Yeah, real deep. Some parts here are real deep. I got a question. Yes. Could the, the, you said Nubian, um, you said a big part of the Nubian village was flooded. No, big, yes, I would say 95% of the Nubian village was flooded by the water. Could that have been prevented? Excuse me? Could it have been prevented? No, 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 no. 
What about what, what if they move uh, the construction of the dam somewhere further away from these villages? Well, it would be the same. It would be the same. What about after the studying the topography of the area, they found that this is the ideal location for the high dam. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, what about building a smaller dam? Would that a, a smaller dam? Would that wouldn't a, do anything? That would that. We have a smaller dam, which is the Aswan Dam. Over the much smaller, and it wasn't that good. Enough. The Nina River. Actually, this project is called Toshka. T O S H A A Toshka. Is it working on that one, right? We are working on it. Yes, it's going to be finished by 2007. I just can't buy that. And the people in Africa don't like it. I just can't buy that. The other African countries don't like if it. Was, if it was white TV, it wouldn't have been there. Yeah. We're about to catch one of these beautiful boats here across to the Philly Temple. As you can see, it is a beautiful sunny day. And nothing but love from our, from our Nubian brothers and sisters. I know you can see the resemblance. Another thing too, I just cannot buy the story about the dam, the, that being the ideal place to build a dam. It gotta be more than it. So you know, we're definitely gonna get you some more information on Revolutionary Cam. That dam needs to be destroyed. Definitely looking for more brothers and sisters coming back home to Africa for repatriation. I would definitely like to see more of you, more of our people. Uh, the temple we're going to see today, right now, is called the Temple of Feeling. And actually, this is one of 17 temples had to be moved, got to pieces and moved, to save it from the flooding of Lake Nof. This temple actually is right in the middle between the two dams, the old dam and the high dam. In the beginning, before the construction of the high dam, before 1961, in the flooding season, which is the summer, they used to, the water used to cover just two-thirds of it for four months. And that's how it looked in the summer. People to visit this place in the summer, they had to use boats like this. Whoa. And again, another one right here. But after the construction of the high dam, it was covered with water completely. I will tell you the story of how saving, the saving of this temple, but at the end, while I'm showing you the original location of this place. The word Philae is derived from the ancient name Pilak meaning the end. It is believed that this is the end. The end. It was believed that that was the end of the Egyptian border. Borders. And actually when they wanted to move this temple 1971, they have chosen this island. It's called the island of Agelica. Another island. It was an empty island. So all the construction that were on the, temp the, the island of Pilak or Philae was moved on this temple. The whole thing ended in 1981. This temple actually is dedicated to one of the major gods of ancient Egypt. The name of this goddess actually is goddess Iset or Isis. And actually 
the myth behind this goddess, the myth behind this temple is the most important among us, all the myths, because this myth is the base of the ancient Egyptian religion. It's the main pillar, it's the foundation of the ancient Egyptian religion because it is part of the theory of creation. The ancient Egyptians believed that before anything was created, there was nothing but water. And they called it noon, the primeval ocean, only water. And one day, a piece of land that has a summit like a pyramid emerged appeared out of the water. On the top of it, God Tom, which is nowadays we say Eto, the perfect, created himself out of nothing. He is the creator of everything. He is the creator of all humans. He is the creator of all gods. As he was a male and no female, he had to spit the next generation. And the next generation were a male and a female. God Shu and God Stifnut. That's their name. Gatshu, the god of the air. Goddess Sifnut, the goddess of moist. A male and female, they married. They gave us two more. God Geb and Goddess Nut. God Geb, the god of earth. Goddess Nut, the goddess of the sky. A male and a female, married. Given us, this time, four kids, four gods. Osiris, or Osar. Isis, or Isit. Neftis and Set, the evil god. Uzar or Osiris was a very good god, very kind to people, very nice to people. He taught them agriculture. And that's how people started to live near the Nile Valley. They loved him so much, they loved him enough to hail him as a king, as the ruler of the people here. He became the ruler with his wife, Isis, and everybody loved him. But his brother, Set, was an evil god, and he was so jealous of his brother, and he wanted to be the king. He wanted to be the ruler. What happened was, Set, as he wanted to get rid of his brother, he ordered his followers to make a very big sarcophagus of pure solid gold, weighing tons of pure solid gold, Indeed, it was precious and semi-precious stones. And this sarcophagus was designed exactly, typically, to fit Osiris. He held a very big party. He invited everybody. He showed them the sarcophagus. They were stunned with the beauty of this thing. Everybody wished that he could have it for himself. He declared to the people, to the gods, all of you, if you want to have this, you can try it. If it fits you, you can have it. So everybody kept on trying. They went in to sleep inside the sarcophagus. Of course, it, of course, it doesn't fit anybody except Osiris. <laughs> Once Osiris went in the sarcophagus, they closed it, they locked it, and threw it into the Nile. Isis went a little bit upset about it. And actually, the current of the Nile took this sarcophagus out to the Mediterranean. The current of the Mediterranean took it to Phoenicia, which is nowadays Lebanon. And over there, as he was a symbol of agriculture, lots of trees grew around him. Isis was the goddess of magic. She succeeded to grow a couple of wings. And she started flying all over the place, looking for her husband. And finally, with the help of other gods, birds, and animals, she succeeded to find this sarcophagus by the shores of Phoenicia, which is nowadays Lebanon. They took it back to Egypt. They placed it under a tree. She opened it. Using her magic, she succeeded to put life back into her husband for a few minutes. Within a few minutes, she got his seed into herself. Then she closed the sarcophagus after he is dead again, and she became pregnant with Heru, Horus, the falcon god. One day, Seth was hunting at night. It was a full moon. And this sarcophagus, as it was made out of pure solid gold, from a distance, it reflected the moonbeam. So, from a distance, God said, saw something sparkling. He went to see what is going on. He found the sarcophagus with his brother in it. He went furious. He opened it and cut it into 42 pieces, putting each piece in one of the 42 provinces of ancient Egypt. Isis went back. She found out what happened. 
she kept on flying again, collecting the parts of her husband. She collected him, mummified him. According to that, he became in this position, like this. We call it the Uzzari position as a mummy. And of course, he became the ruler and the king of the underworld, the, the god who judges all the dead persons. Of course, she was so frightened for her child in her belly, she hid until she delivered the baby. The baby was so weak. So she gave him to the cow, got his heart cold, to take care of him, to suckle him the sacred milk so he would get stronger and stronger. And that's why her name is Hathor. The ancient name is not like this actually. It was Hut Her or Hut Heru, the house of Horus. She is the one who took care of Horus. She is the one who suckled him the sacred milk till he became a strong boy and then he started growing. They hid him, of course, from his uncle Seth. His uncle Seth kept on looking for him, trying to get rid of him. He knew that he might claim the throne one day. And that's what happened. When Horus became strong, young, God, he started asking for the throne. He believed that he is the religion with her. He is the son of Osiris, the main king. He was a very strong God. He started fighting his uncle Seth. Seth was not a weak God. He was the God of the deserts, the God of storms, a very powerful God. This struggle took hundreds of years to be finished. Sometimes Horus gets the upper hand. Sometimes Seth gets the upper hand. During the fight, Horus lost his eye, which became the Ujat eye, or the protective eye of Horus, and he got it healed in Komombo. Remember the temple of yesterday, the, the, the hospital over there? So he got it healed over there. He kept on fighting his uncle. His uncle became so old, he could not fight back anymore, so he disguised as a hippo and, a, and his followers as crocodiles. He jumped into the Nile to hide from his own nephew. Horus became the king. Egypt, he started ruling Egypt, and actually, after some time, all the gods went up to heaven, and the people ruled the earth, and the king became Horus. So the king of ancient Egypt, his main title is Golden Horus, or Horus on earth. He represents Horus also as the son of Osiris. That's why he dies. When the king dies after his death, he would like to change into Osiris to be the king of the hereafter and to pass the journey of the underworld peacefully. This myth is the base, is the foundation of all the ancient Egyptian religion or the main ideas of the ancient Egyptian religion. Remember, continuity was one of the main features of the ancient Egyptian religion. This kind of thing lasted for thousands and thousands of years. Dr. Runuko, would you like to add something? No, I just want to say that it's also the basis of much of modern Western religion. Now, you told him about the castration of Osiris? No. Now, there are variations of the story. For example, one story talks about on one day, on the first day, a loud voice called out into the world that the king of all has come, and that is Osar, or Osiris. And the next day, his brother Set is born. And they are like good and evil. They are symbolic. Um, night and darkness. Um, the original twins. Almost like Cain and Abel in a sense. And ultimately, um, Asar empowers Aset, or Isis. Isis is very important. Among other things, she introduces the concept of domesticity. She invents the wedding ring. And he is so successful at civilizing the Nile Valley that he goes out of the Nile Valley. He goes into India. He goes into Arabia. But he doesn't take an army. He takes a flute. He travels all over the world. He doesn't conquer people. Everybody wants to be like him. He's like, I guess you might say, the original gentleman, the original good guy. And then he comes back and he's murdered. Or he dies in the chest. And another variation of the story is, is after he's found in the swamp, then he's castrated. And then Aset gets pregnant. That has to be an immaculate conception. And the child that is the fruit of that product has to be the uh, result of a virgin birth because his penis is gone, his phallus is gone. When he's mummified, he is the original mummy. So a lot of the things that we can see in what is called the Osirian drama, you can find as the basis of Christianity also. And this is the difficulty that many of us are having because we are taught that the story of Jesus and Mary is the original story. There's a book called The World's 16 Crucified Saviors, and they talk about a similar phenomenon with Buddha, 
and Krishna in India and Lao Tse in China. And Mithra. So what we're talking about... Mm -hmm. Mithra. Exactly, in mm -hmm. Persia and Iraq. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking about today is really the foundation of Western religion, at least as far as Christianity and Judaism is concerned. And this is something that many of us will have difficulty with because of our Christian orientation. We are taught not to question, not to challenge, and to believe that these things which are largely mythological, we believe, are in fact actual and factual. But it didn't just happen in the Bible. Long before the Bible is written, the people in this country, our ancestors, are practicing these same concepts. So that's what I want you all to think about as we wander through this temple. It will give you a lot of food for thought. That's what I would add. Okay. That's right. Thank you for that, Brian. In the traditional skin. By the way, this temple was built during the Greek Roman period or rebuilt during the Greek Roman period. But the oldest part in this temple actually is an altar belonging to King Tahak. And I will show it to you, 25th dynasty, the king who gained the fame of the empire after the first invasion of the Persian. So right here you see the traditional scene. And this traditional scene here is for King Ptolemy XII, Sneus Dionysius of the Piper, the father of Cleopatra VII. He is in the traditional scene holding the enemies before Isis, smiting them before Isis. You will see lots of defacing here caused by the early Christians. And by the way, this temple is the last pagan temple to be closed practicing the ancient Egyptian religion, and that was 572 AD. Theodorus, the Egyptian bishop of Egypt, sent a military campaign into this place, ordered them to close this temple as the last pagan temple, ordered them to kill all the priests of goddess Isis using this temple as a church, and I will show you exactly which part of this temple was used as a church. Remember this date, 572 BC, that's when this temple was closed as the last pagan temple. And, and what happens after that? Europe goes into the Dark Ages, after the closure of that temple. These are very important concepts. If you are not going to Abu Simbel, this is the last temple you're going to see. And there's a reason we wanted to close on this note, because in a way this should seal the deal. This should capsulize everything we've seen so far. Take a look, you see this big ground altar. Can you see it? This is the oldest part of this temple. It's the altar of King Tahar. The oldest part of this temple, right here on this island. And you can see that the features of the gods, or the gods and the Ptolemies, are defaced by the other creatures. They make it all the Ptolemies, they make it all the Ptolemies. Of course, the main figures would be the Cyrus, the Pelside, and the Island. of granites. Actually it was a huge rock, you could not remove it so they just smoothed it and used it as a stela. And this stela was done by Ptolemy V and right here he is recording that he has dedicated the Dodi Kashonios and actually it is a piece of land about 130 miles between here and the south totally to be under the needs of Karis Isis. That's what he is recording on that stela. I run it. Run it. My brothers and sisters, we had the Philae Temple On the outside island. of Aswan, Egypt. Aswan is part of the Nubian area, which is uh, south of, which is South Egypt, all the way down to North Sudan. So between North Sudan and South Egypt, we have the Nubian area. And this temple has been moved from its original location due to the building of the racist Aswan High Dam, which we have seen earlier. And you can see we have a beautiful, view, small, beautiful island. Nice little view, rock. Yeah, player. Temple and everything. And my brother have we have seen some of the historic stories of how Christianity 
came from, from Brother Walid and Renoko Rashidi breaking it down. And I hope you're paying attention to that because that's very important. And you can, you can do your own studies and research and you'll see civilization started in the Nile Valley. Everything we have today, this came from the foundation of Egypt. And that's why it's so important for us to get into our history books and study our own history and not the history what other people are telling us. Alright brothers, Hotep. We have a lot of young kids out here, as you can see, staring these boats. Learning responsibility at an early age. This is the temple of Ramesses the Great at Abu Simbel. And these statues are at least 100, 150 foot tall. That's a big one. Okay, good. Excuse me. That's a... This temple, of course, is not built. It's cut in the living rock of the mountain. And it's one of 17 temples had to be moved. Actually, this temple was taken up 70 feet back, 220 feet. So it should be down there where the water is. Of course, they had to dismantle it to pieces. They had to cut it to pieces. And actually, it's not just one temple. We have two temples, one and two. Two temples, the big temple for Ramesses II and the smaller one for his beloved wife, Queen Nefertari, identifying her as Goddess Hathor, the cow-headed goddess, the goddess of love, music, joy, and maternity, the goddess who took care of Horus till he became strong. This temple was cut to 830 pieces. The small one over there, 235 pieces. And of course, each piece had a number, like we saw before in the Temple of Philae, and it was like a puzzle putting it back together again. But of course, they needed to imitate the nature where it was already, which is it was carved in the mountain. So they had to bring it first here, and they had to imitate the mountain behind it. So on both temples, they had to build a very big and huge dome of concrete. The dome itself is one of the modern architectural miracle. It's a span of 180 feet, no pillars, no columns supporting it. And then they brought trucks from all over the place, sticking it to this dome, imitating the original site of this temple, which is the mount itself. Of course, Ramesses II constructed, or not actually ordered, doing this temple right here because it's not constructed, for two main reasons. Number one, to be worshipped as a god away from the influence and the power of the priests of God Haman Ra in Luxor by the temple of Karnak. Second, to store the gold which comes from the southern part of Nubia, right here under the authority of the ruler of Kush, to be transferred later on to Luxor or the capital of Egypt at that time. Ramesses II inaugurated this temple in the 26th year of his reign. Remember, he ruled for 67 years. At that time, his queen Nefertari, the state wife, the royal wife, the beloved wife, she was dying sick. That's why she couldn't attend this big celebration. So he used his daughter as the royal lady. She came with him into this area and they integrated the temple together. But actually, after five years, a big earthquake took place, which caused a big destruction in the statue over there. They never told the king about that because he never did visit this area after. And by the way, Ramses II, while he was the crown prince, he was the prince of Nubia. He was responsible for this area under the authority of his father, of course, Siti I. 
So he loved this area very much, and he integrated, and he, uh, in a way, um, I would say, admired this area. That's why he decided to have this temple right here for himself. Actually, this temple, it's a rock cut temple, cut in the mountain but cut in the mountain in a very special way. It's 180 feet deep. And actually, also, the ancient architecture miracle, which is, this temple was cut in a way that makes the sun enter the temple 180 feet deep to cover three statues of the four in the sanctuary twice every year, the 22nd of February and the 22nd of October. They say that this is the, uh, the birthday of the king and the day of his coronation. We don't know exactly what is the birthday of King Ramesses II, what is the birthday or, or the, the coronation day of Ramesses II, we don't know. So it's not really like this, but it well, it's concerning a very important rite, right in the ancient Egyptian religion, which is uniting the statue of the god with the sun. Remember, they used to take the golden statue, put it on the roof. I talked about that before to be united with the sun. But as the statues of the gods here are carved in the mountain, they can't move them outside, so they brought the sun into the gods inside the sanctuary or the holy of the holies. So over there, as I'm going to explain to you, as I'm going to show you in one of the pictures, we have four statues inside the sanctuary itself. Let us first discuss the facade of this temple, which we have here. Four huge statues for Ramesses II carved in the mountain, the height of each one of them 66 feet high. They are cult statues and they have names like the beloved of the gods, the beloved of Aten, the beloved of Amon, the lord of the two lands. Which two lands? Which two lands? North and, North and south, upper and lower. Uh, so he is here seated on his throne and between his legs you can see the small figures for some of his daughters, his wife and his beloved sons. And of course one of them should be his crown prince. Actually, the one who succeeded Ramesses II was son number 13, Merimtah. It was the 12 mm. sons of Ramesses II, the 12 first sons of Ramesses II died during his life. <laughs> so his successor was son number 13. Remember, he had more than 45 wives, 181 sons that told us, according to the records, maybe he had much more than that. So Ramesses II is seated here on his own, visited four times, and they are called statues. And over there, right in the middle, above the entrance, you can see the statue of God Rahur Akhti, the God of the sunrise, coming out of the mountain, moving outside the mountain. He is holding two things in his hands. In one hand, he is holding the Ma'at, the Ma'at, the order, the cosmic order. On the other side, or the other hand, he is holding what is known as Usir, power. So he, he, he has everything order and power in his hand and by the way and I wouldn't say it was by accident that's the name of Ramesses the second or one of the names of Ramesses the second Usir Ma'at Ra the powerful justice of God Ra so Ramesses the second placed his name on the temple in a metaphoric way showing the God coming out of the mountain holding the Usir and the Ma'at and at the same time we see two figures for Ramesses the second on both sides adoring the statue of the God in a way, adoring his own name represented in this God. Also, you are going to notice up on the top we have many seated baboons. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. The seated baboons, actually, remember the baboons were at the bottom of the obelisk, right? Mm -hmm. They are the followers of Gadra. And also, they were the dwellers of the last hour of the 12th hour.